Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. The Wampanoag, meaning people of the first light, are Native Americans of the northeastern woodlands based in southeastern Massachusetts. The Wampanoag were part of a larger group of North American Indians known as the Algonquian. They and many of the other native peoples in New England spoke a language belonging to the Algonquian language family and is most closely related to those spoken by the Mohican. How did these indigenous tribes view themselves and the world around them in the period immediately preceding contact with Europeans? Eric Yanis of the Other States of America podcast reconstructs Wampanoag society in the time before the Mayflower, New England's Plymouth, and the Thanksgiving story. There has actually been a lot of debate over, were the Wampanoag matrilineal or patrilineal? Did they reckon power through their mother's side of the family, through their father's side of the family? Not just power, but inheritance and identity, much like how in the English world, your last name is typically your father's last name. That's part of your identity now. Despite modern native traditions, the Wampanoag were matrilineal. The anthropological consensus is that the Wampanoag had some sort of a mixed system. There was some balance between the sexes when determining family lines, who would be sachem and who would inherit what. So again, as a result, if you were born into the Wampanoag world, your inner nuclear family, who's your mom, who's your dad, who are your siblings, was more important than your dad's extended family or your mother's extended family to your everyday life, and where you potentially stand in your adulthood in the rankings of leadership in the Wampanoag world. But you're just a baby. You don't have to worry about all of this yet. The Puritans were quick to notice and record that Wampanoag mothers seem to have been overindulgent to the European standard and overly affectionate. In other words, they were really good mothers. But you would have lived in a cruel time all around the world, a cruel time, a more primitive time, a more dangerous time. So at a young age, male or female, you would have been raised to use a bow and arrow. And as soon as you were able to, you would help guard the fields, practicing your hunting skills on the small animals scurrying about trying to eat your crops. And before you knew it, your childhood was over. Unlike today, where you can basically be a child square into your 20s. With the onset of puberty came adulthood. Of course, for women, this moment is marked with a specific event, and it would cause the women from that point afterward to have to go to a special segregated menstrual hut. But for the boys, their transition into adulthood, just being the human species that we are, is more vague. It's more gradual. And so like many cultures across the world, there was a coming of age ceremony for every young man, a moment whereby afterward you would treat this person as an adult versus the child that they were previous to it. One such ritual involved Wampanoag boys being sent out into the wilderness to survive the winters by themselves, meanwhile ingesting various poisons to test the strength of their body, leaving as boys but returning in the spring as men, at least in the eyes of the community. And again, I'm attempting to reconstruct the pre-European Wampanoag culture using the earliest sources, which just happened to be written by Europeans. I guarantee this wasn't the only coming-of-age ritual. And I guarantee not every boy had to do this. Maybe something less severe, maybe something more severe. The Wampanoag were not homogenous. For example, just because one Wampanoag village on Martha's Vineyard had a ritual doesn't mean that a Wampanoag village on the mainland had the same ritual. Or even a Wampanoag village on the other side of Martha's Vineyard. There's a lot of variety among the Wampanoag people, and even the English noticed this. The English were notorious for not understanding Native Americans. Even they could tell that the Wampanoag had a diverse and different culture place to place. And this is actually the secret to their survival to this day. Anyway, back to the generalities. As you can imagine, the Wampanoag world was full of beaches. And so they played a lot of games on the beach. These games would become community events when they would play with neighboring villages and other tribes within the Wampanoag. But often, each village was considered its own tribe. So while they might all be described as Wampanoag, the umbrella term, they also have a more local name for who they are. And so just like sports teams today, you're going to root for your home team. 
and intertribal rivalries are so much better solved playing a game on the beach than smashing in heads, right? But let's say you're not a team player. You're more about yourself. Well, if you were at one of these games, you'd usually get the chance to wager on the outcome. You would bring goods that other people would want, things that you could use to bet with. And just like some table games in a casino today, you would use the beach sands to organize your bets. But let's leave childhood behind. Let's leave behind the games. You are a newly minted Wampanoag adult. And with that, you might take it upon yourself to change your name to represent this new phase in your life, common in the Wampanoag world and the general Algonquian world. And then commonly, you might also change your name when going to war, especially if it's a particularly large endeavor, or when assuming some title of power. The gender roles were similar to the Iroquois, where the women would be in charge of the farming, the cooking, the general household, and directing the harvest. All things internal. Men were external. We see this a lot in different Native American groups. They were in charge of war, the politics between the larger political entities. But they did have roles in this internal world where the women would have them build the structures for the most part. Of course, the women would help. The women also tasked their men with breaking up the land, clearing new lands for farms, managing the forests and the brush with controlled burns, and helping with the harvest. As any farmer in the Northeast will tell you, that's an all-hands-on-deck situation. Very narrow window of time to get everything picked. And so again, you're a young Wampanoag, you've been doing your work, everyone seems to like you, you're fitting in, you're productive, you might start to think about marriage. This would prove to be a negotiation between the nuclear families of you and whoever you're interested in. Your parents would send gifts to the parents of your love interest. And the sources seem to reflect that both you could choose your mate and then start the process of negotiating between the families, or your parents could arrange a marriage for you. But no matter where this actually began, you're going to need the approval of both sets of parents. After that, the two families would finalize this marriage by receiving the approval of the sachem, the chief of your tribe, again a subdivision of the Wampanoag, and or the community as a whole. Popular knowledge of the Wampanoag, especially outside of New England, is completely consumed with the holiday of Thanksgiving and the founding myths we pour onto it and what it means to us today. When Europeans first show up, the Wampanoag were a progressing people, just like everybody else in the world. With the introduction of corn or maize, the burial practices of the Wampanoag and other people change suddenly. Something like how you bury your dead loved ones is an incredibly intimate and meaningful thing. Before the introduction of corn, we see that the dead are buried, and then after a while they're undug and then reburied in a mass grave with the rest of the dead from their community. The exact manner and meaning can't be truly known, of course, but the Huron had a similar practice as well as a lot of other natives in the Northeast. But after the introduction of corn to the Wampanoag and their very close neighbors, their burial practices changed drastically. Instead of communal graves, we have individual graves. Perhaps that denotes a growth of individualism of independence or a shrinking of the value of the community or the family versus individual freedoms. The dead are put in a fetal position, pointing west and covered with red ochre paint. Instead of this communal afterlife where they were shared with the community, the soul would go instead on some sort of journey in the westward direction. In what little we know of the Wampanoag religion, the spirit of the dead were going to voyage to the land of the great spirit known as Kiaten. This great spirit was believed to not have any sort of gender, no human form, abstract, and so was also the creator of everything. It is believed that Kiatin made the first couple and taught them how to farm maize. There was also a spirit of death called Chipi. And your mind, of course, goes straight to European ideas of Satan or the devil. But even early European explorers had to note that Chipi was not exactly the evil character that the Western devil would be. Among the Wampanoag and their neighbors, the name of the spirit was often synonymous with just the action of dying or the word death. So Chipi wasn't seen as an opposite of the creator, but the way I figure it more in an Eastern sense of a necessary destroyer in order for there to be new creation. The Wampanoag could also call upon Chipi as they could any other spirit. It wasn't a devil to be avoided. It was a powerful spirit that could be used to your own benefit if Chipi so decides to help you. But he would become represented by opposites 
of the great creator. The great creator lives in the west. Cheapy lived under the sea to the east. Cheapy was the spirit of the winter, the cold, the night, the opposite of the summer and the harvest and the warmth and the day that the great creator, of course, gave to the Wampanoag people. But just like the turn of the day into night and the seasons in their course, Cheapy served as a counterbalance to the great spirit, not in competition, but in rotation. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride. <laughs>